there is probably no horror game series that has been the subject of more undeserved disrespect than Fatal Frame. Actually, forget horror game series and just make that video game series, full stop. These are games that have been hailed by critics and fans alike as definitive must-play horror titles that rank alongside the all-time grades. And yet, publishers and marketers never seem to know exactly what to do with the Fatal Frame games. No entry in the series has ever sold blockbuster numbers, and in its now 20 years of existence, the franchise has been bounded and shuffled between no less than six different publishers worldwide, like the world's worst game of haunted hot potato. This is, pardon my French, a damn shame. The Fatal Frame series absolutely lives up to the title of cult classic. This is because of how well it manages the most essential part of the horror gaming experience, the dialectical synthesis of opposites. <laughs> the player spends plenty of time sifting through the metaphoric murk of a haunted house or village, only for this slow-boiling tension to be suddenly punctuated by moments of sheer pants-soiling run-for-the-hills terror as you're set upon by wailing armies of ghastly and ghostly undead. <laughs> Then, you face your fears, overcome them, and earn the key to surpass whatever obstacle is blocking your way. This expert balance of exploration and combat highlights how the Fatal Frame games are, at their core, a perfect symbiosis of excellent action gaming, intriguing backstory and folklore, and gripping horror thrills. All this, combined with a signature Fatal Frame ghost design, making you face not vile, aggressive monsters, but tragic entities locked between life and death within an emotional spectrum ranging from eternally sad and mortally angry, not at you personally, but at the tragic circumstances of their lives and deaths, while you, the player, are the one who bears the brunt of it. It's truly unmatched, and Mask of the Lunar Eclipse is no exception to the series' iconic handwriting in this. Longtime series developer Tecmo Kawaii is perhaps most famous for mechanically dense fighting games like Dead or Alive or for the joyously hyperkinetic action of Ninja Gaiden. And that same game design pedigree is easily evident in Fatal Frame as well. These games are so frightening in large part because of how mechanically compelling they are. As in, they're just a ton of fun to play. And wouldn't you know it, Right on time for spooky season this year, the previously Wii U only title Maiden of the Black Water is getting a proper port on modern hardware at the end of October. Maiden of the Black Water is a very solid game. I won't go so far as saying you should pre-order it, because you should really never pre-order digital only games. Never, ever, ever, because it reinforces the horrible business practices by publishers that we all loathe so much but this is absolutely the sort of release that is worth supporting. If only to signal to Nintendo that yes, the Fatal Frame fandom is alive and well. There are dozens of us, dozens! But today, we're going to explore a different game in the series. The mythical lost chapter of the Fatal Frame saga and the only entry to never be released outside of Japan. The absence of an international release means that this is the most overlooked game in the series by far, and easily one of the most overlooked modern horror games in existence. And that's, again, a damn shame, because not only is this game an absolute joy to play, it's a serious contender for the crown of best game in the series. I'm not joking here, up there with Crimson Butterfly. And the fact that to this day, the game remains locked to the Wii hardware, with no official translation or re-release or anything else. This is the very definition of an unpunished capital crime. Luckily, there exists a phenomenally implemented fan translation that runs marvelously on emulators, about which I'll certainly go into more detail and, at the same time, ensure that the group of admirable buccaneers of video game preservation responsible for it receive the standing ovations they deserve for their work. But more on that later. 
I've covered the first three games in this series on my channel before, so the time has come to tell the tale of the legendary lost entry in the series. And not only that, but it's far past time for a full accounting of the many heroes and villains who operated behind the scenes of this tale. This is Zero Tsukiyami no Kamen, or as we call it unofficially in the West, Fatal Frame 4 Mask of the Lunar Eclipse. This game totally reinvents many key elements of the series formula, and yet it nevertheless plays and feels just like a bona fide Fatal Frame title. And as with every Fatal Frame game that came before, it shows just how terrifying video games can be. Though Fatal Frame has never been a top-selling series, or even a top-selling survival horror series, each title served as its own worthwhile entry in the horror gaming canon, and each game greatly expanded upon or improved what came before it. Fatal Frame 1 set a compelling template for the whole series, while also helping to inspire a new generation of survival horror games. Fatal Frame 2 was a damn near perfect horror experience that elevated the established formula to new heights of mechanical excellence, and Fatal Frame 3 would give the series a truly epic sense of scope with its multiple playable characters and intersecting narratives. But by the mid to late 2000s, the survival horror genre was in new territory. This was the age of the omnipresent Resident Evil 4 over the shoulder viewpoint. From the early days of survival horror through the mid-2000s, the fixed camera or fixed perspective viewpoints were considered essential elements of the classic survival horror experience. But with the revolution of Resi 4, the third-person over-the-shoulder perspective became the new gold standard, not just for horror games, but also for pretty much all action and adventure games going forward. Fatal Frame 4 saw the series adapting not only to this change of perspective, but also to one of the most intriguing new developments to happen in gaming at the time, the widespread adoption of motion controls, thanks to the explosive and world-devouring popularity of the Nintendo Wii. To give you some perspective of just what a cultural juggernaut the Wii was, Wii Sports is still the fourth best-selling game of all time, weighing in at nearly 83 million copies sold. And that was purely on the strength of it being a pack-in game for the Wii, just like the old Mario Duck Hunt combo back in the NES days. By way of comparison, Todd Howard's Perpetual Motion Machine, aka Skyrim, has sold an estimated 30 million copies across its many, many, many releases and remasters. Good, let's get this over with. The Wii's massive popularity meant that motion controls had very suddenly become a big thing in the gaming space. And with Nintendo having acquired the exclusive publishing rights to the Fatal Frame series, Kawaii Tecmo began work on a next generation horror title that would make the most of this new tech. But for a big league project like this, they couldn't have just let any old auteur fill the director's role. This required someone with a legendary sense of aesthetics and cool, a keen eye for what makes action and horror games great. The chair of co-director for this game was filled by one of the best in the business, Goichi Suda, or as he's better known and loved, Suda51. Suda51 and his comrades at Grasshopper Manufacturer were front and center in the development of this game, and it really shows. The signature Suda touch is evident right away in Fatal Frame 4, even before you picked up a controller. The aesthetic of Mask of the Lunar Eclipse makes heavy use of blue-yellow color contrast, which marks a striking departure from the traditional survival horror color palette of washed-out grey-brown greens. This game is bathed in soft moonlight blues and inky purple blacks, which are punctuated by warm and hazy yellow illuminations. These tweaks to the Fatal Frame style are even more effective for how they subtly complement the overall tone of the series. This is most definitely a Fatal Frame game, but one with a very own unique vibe and aesthetic. 
And the cumulative effect is a masterful, almost painterly interplay between shadow and light, warm and cold, tableaus of curtains flapping softly in the pale moonlight, and of dim illumination setting soft shadows dancing down haunted hallways. Not to mention how the protagonist's bright yellow dress positively pops in contrast to her cool blue environs. The fresh over-the-shoulder perspective, the adoption of motion controls, and the striking new aesthetic, all of these ingredients give rise to a game that is so much more than just a competent entry in a venerable series. These tweaks and change-ups to the established formula didn't just give the Fatal Frame series a new lease on life. Mask of the Lunar Eclipse represents nothing short of a quiet revolution in survival horror game design. Seriously. A total thrill ride from stem to stern that elevated horror gaming to new realms of terror. Motion controls. Ah, oh, Dan, I can't. Why this is, this is so more than dumb. Ever. This is so dumb. <laughs> Are generally not well loved. And sure, sometimes that bad reputation is rightfully earned. <laughs> but while a lot of energy has been expended in critique of bad or cringe worthy examples of motion controls, there's been far, far less critical examination of the games that get it right. Because when motion controls are implemented well and done correctly, they can become the magic umami ingredient. That extra dose of interactivity that elevates a good game into something truly sublime. Fatal Frame 4 didn't get an international release, but there were a handful of import reviews that cropped up in the West. And sadly, this game's control scheme was almost uniformly slagged off in the write-ups. In keeping up with the motion controls are for casual dum-dums, hardcore gamer groupthink of the time. While these terrible takes may have aged like yogurt in the desert, the opposite is true of Fatal Frame 4. This game is just as, if not even more, excellent now as it was nearly a decade and a half ago. And that is because of not in spite of the excellent motion controls, which underpin and uplift the entire experience. And that's even more so the case thanks to the magic of modern emulation, which lets you enjoy motion controls without requiring the expensive, proprietary Nintendo-branded Wiimote and Nunchuck. But whoa there, let's pump the brakes for a second. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. We'll get to that part later in the video. Here's the thing. The motion controls in Fatal Frame 4 are so much more than just a gimmick implementation of the Wii's console hardware. Motion controls are pitch perfect on both a mechanical and philosophical level when it comes to horror games. But despite being so complementary to the genre, especially survival horror, motion controls seem to have come and gone from the survival horror scene with very little commentary or critical analysis which makes the experience of playing Fatal Frame 4 for the first time in 2021 feel all the more remarkable. An absolutely unexpected breath of fresh air in a genre that's been dear to my heart for decades where I feel it's hard to thoroughly surprise me at this point in time. Survival Horror is a game design niche where the player's movement is purposefully designed to feel weighty and considered, full of friction and momentum. I mean, hell, this is the exact reason why there's a whole dang schism in the church of survival horror around the sacredness of tank controls. At this point, we're just a few months away from some upstart HIO dev nailing their 95 theses to the cathedral doors. Ah, is this joke too heretical? Where are all my Catholics in the audience? Anyway, the motion of the player character is always a primary consideration in survival horror games. Movement is often slow or cumbersome, which means you need to be thoughtful and intuitively favor a defensive, planned approach as you navigate through trap and monster-filled labyrinths, which makes them an extremely potent means to immerse the player in their role via the simulation of physical movement, especially in a survival horror context. And it's here where Mask of the Lunar Eclipse really struts it off. As you navigate the haunted warrens of Rugetsu Island, you'll use the motion controls to point at different parts of the environment and train your character's gaze, and therefore the camera perspective, in that direction. No longer will you have to patrol each and every room's perimeter, furiously mashing the interact button as you hope to catch a hidden item or trigger a concealed switch. 
In Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, it's only by shining your flashlight directly on different parts of the environment that you can find items, solve puzzles, and discern where to go next. Combat follows a similar scheme. Once you ready the trusty camera obscura, you'll use the motion controls to aim the viewfinder in first person, with movement along the X and Y axes tied to both pointing and rolling the controller. And as is the serious tradition, the longer you wait to charge your shot and the closer the enemies creep, the more powerful your attacks become. You can also shake the controller to execute a 180 quick turn, or to play the artful dodger when the ghosts lunge at you. At least, until you fall down on your ass trying it one too many times. Fatal Frame is already a tense experience when you're being set upon by wailing ghostly assailants, but the addition of motion controls gives it an uncanny physicality that is both thrilling and terrifying. I personally am somebody whose response to jump scares is almost exclusively stoic, and that's not a bragging thing, I'm just severely anhedonic. But Fatal Frame really got my blood pumping through its masterful blend of thrilling spirit combat and immersive motion controls multiple times throughout the game. The ghosts themselves get an upgrade too. These specters seethe, roil, and lunge across the room, rather than serenely floating to and fro before coming in for a hug like they did in the previous games. This is well and truly a next-generation Fatal Frame, in every sense of the phrase. Now, that is not to say that Fatal Frame 4 represents a huge leap in visual fidelity over previous games. The Wii was, under the hood, basically a slightly souped-up GameCube in terms of raw processing power. But the new camera perspective and gameplay elements, the killer aesthetic, the absolutely next-level sound design, and, yes, the deeply immersive motion controls Taken together, it all represents a huge leap forward in quality for the series. It is also a savvy maturation of the core principles of Fatal Frame. Spooky ghosts, terrifying emergent jump scares, fragile protagonists, and an atmosphere of all-consuming dread. And it is here that we must once again salute and pay tribute to that mad lad Suda51. As one of the first developers to get his hands on the Wii dev kit and hardware ahead of the console's 2006 debut, his game's imaginative use of motion controls are high watermark for this control style, especially when it comes to action games. You bastard! They're trying to butter up the gamers! Your fight is here in the real world! Son of a bitch! Nice work, dickhead! What I'm saying is, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse is a kill-the-past game. Sorry, I don't make the rules. That high level of quality and attention to aesthetic detail can be found in every nook and cranny of Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, down to how you hold the A button to collect items, slowly extending your grasp and rendering yourself vulnerable to some well-timed surprises. It's foreboding and scary every single time, and even more so if nothing happens at all. It always kept me on my toes, and I'll never look at collecting lore notes the same way again. The switch to the Resi 4 camera perspective, likewise, marks a superb modernization of the series formula. And seriously, it's so well implemented that in the first 20 minutes or so, I didn't even consciously notice that the game was not in a fixed camera perspective. It just felt perfectly fatal frame. With the camera pulled in so close, the environs feel that much more claustrophobic and you're that much more connected to your character's physicality. And it's not just perceived, but the closeness of the camera also allows the level designers to narrow the corridors and environs drastically, because the architecture doesn't need to accommodate for the wide static camera lens anymore. And claustrophobia is a surefire dash of seasoning that makes a good survival war dish. Good soup. And speaking of trademark artistic touches and level design, Kuwait Tecmo is definitely at the top of their level design game as well. Gone are the spacious hallways and courtyards of the original, which were actually quite a bit wider and more expansive than real traditional Japanese households. Here on Rugetsu Island, it's all long, narrow and ominous corridors, usually flanked by curtains flapping atmospherically and forebodingly in the moonlight. 
the over-the-shoulder viewpoint means you will rarely be bowled over by specters lunging from blind spots in the scenery, the favorite trick of the fixed camera game. In Fatal Frame 4, ghosts will now suddenly just appear right in front of you without ever using non-diegetic sound cues or musical stings to announce their arrival as in cheap horror flicks, which is to me so much more effective. It's not a cheap trick, you're really scared of what you're seeing right in front of you, Kaido style. The scares here are intensely up close and personal, and are all the more terrifying for it. The story of Fatal Frame 4 begins in media's res, with best friends Misaki and Madoka exploring the halls of a very creepy abandoned hospital on Rugetsu Island, far afield in rural Japan. Though they suffer from memory loss due to an unspecified trauma in their past, they are looking for something on this island that they sense is connected to the recent brutal murders of two of their friends. But then, Something foul and fatal befalls both Misaki and Madoka as well. And so, our main protagonist, Ruka Minazuki, soon follows after them and becomes enmeshed in the calamitous curse that has gripped this island. And from there, a tale of amnesia, abuse and mad science gone awry unfolds scene by scene. This is classic Fatal Frame storytelling, where every new note or cutscene further peels back the narrative's layers to reveal the horrific events that drew Ruka and her friends to Rugetsu Island. And each new story beat further unearths the grisly trauma that caused their paralyzing amnesia. Naturally, this being Fatal Frame, this horror yarn is steeped in Shintoism, ghosts and folklore. And of course, center stage in this tale, as always, is the mysterious camera obscura that can see and banish supernatural curses. Heck, this game is so rooted in the folkloric history of Japan that it was released in the dead heat of midsummer in 2008, in order to coincide with the country's famous tradition of the Hyakumonogatari Kaidankai, as I've talked about in a previous video. But the real history surrounding this game is quite a bit more muddled and a whole lot less reverent. Project Zero Four debuted to rave reviews in the Japanese press and was at the time the most popular and, yep, the most financially successful entry in the entire series, selling nearly 100,000 copies in Japan alone. But despite this tremendous, unarguably huge success and considerable achievement for the series, Nintendo responded with a shrug. They decided the game was still too niche and opted not to license it for release worldwide. You see, as part of the deal that brought Fatal Frame to the Wii, Nintendo gained exclusive rights to further worldwide licensing and distribution for the entire series, up until today. And in a supremely Nintendo move, they pulled a Mother 3 on us and decided that Mask of the Lunar Eclipse was too good for us ungrateful gaijin. And so it has remained locked in the Nintendo vault to this very day. And normally, that would have been that. Another legendary lost classic of a game, consigned forever to international obscurity and forgotten. But wait, if Fatal Frame 4 was never released outside of Japan, then how have I been playing it in English? Fatal Frame is no ordinary series. And Fatal Frame fans are no ordinary otaku. A powerhouse trio of cyberpunk ROM hackers known as Tempest, Chabi and Mr. Mongoose put in the yeoman's work of translating the entire game, replacing all the Japanese text with a slick English font, line by painstaking line and providing captions for all dialogue. But their efforts went even further than that, well above and beyond your average, already commendable enthusiast fan translation job. These mad lads actually went to the length to code into every key texture in the game that contains kanji the proper English translations underneath or next to the Japanese signage. Which, holy hell, there just aren't enough superlatives in the dictionary for how incredibly cool this is. These dedicated super fans have basically produced what feels like a full professional localization job, virtually free of any grammatical or spelling errors even. Thanks to the patch they authored, Fatal Frame devotees can enjoy a full playthrough in English on either a modded Wii or the Dolphin emulator. 
I've talked a lot in recent videos about the importance of preserving older video games, and Fatal Frame 4, not to mention its incredible fan translation, is the perfect example for and testament to why emulation and quote-unquote piracy is so critical to these efforts. The game runs like a dream on the Dolphin emulator and looks incredible with just simple upscaling to 1080p, like you're watching now. But the real magic here is how Dolphin can link up with middleware programs like DS4 Windows or Better Joy and use a modern gamepad's built-in gyroscope, for instance like in the PS4 or 5 or Xbone gamepads, to emulate the motion controls of the original Wiimote and Nunchuck. This was the approach used to record all the footage you've watched throughout the video, and it worked surprisingly flawlessly all the way through. Honestly, it felt even a bit tighter and more responsive than the original Wii's motion controls. There's truly no reason not to try this game out for yourself with all these means at our disposal, crafted free and non-profit by enthusiastic preservationists. As always, you'll find a link in the description of this video to a document that helps you calibrate and set everything up so you can enjoy Fatal Frame 4 yourself. Long live the retro gaming pirates and preservationists, the true folklorists of our time. Long live emulation. When they are, click on our canvas. Gather round, lads and lasses, gather round. In a pirate ship, in pirate waters, in a pirate world. We've survived a full three nights in Himura Mansion. We face down the horrific twin deities of the lost village, and we've walked into the depths of the Manor of Sleep and braved its grisly tattoo curse. But the grim mysteries of Rugetsu Island may be our greatest challenge yet. At least until we begin our hike up Hikami Mountain. Mask of the Lunar Eclipse is a triumph of survival horror game design. It is a fatal frame at its most gripping and thrilling, not to mention haunt your nightmares terrifying. And after playing it, I consider it an absolutely essential survival horror experience for fans of the genre and newcomers alike. It's very much worth experiencing on its own merits, because a few games have tried this combination of motion controls and purebred survival horror gameplay, and the most noteworthy ones are the other Fatal Frame games that came out for the Wii and Wii U. They're actually pretty great too. The Wii-only remake of Fatal Frame 2 updates Crimson Butterfly using the same engine as Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, and it's an equally all-killer, no-filler experience. This one only got a European release outside of Japan, but I guess where Nintendo is concerned, that's better than nothing. And thanks to the efforts of a few valiant folklorists who have preserved the longevity of these games via emulation so that they may be handed down through the ages, the saga of Fatal Frame is playable right now on any mid-range PC or laptop equipped with a modern gamepad. Because when the lunar eclipse is at its zenith, and the fragments of the sacred mass are gathered once more, the gates of hell will open, and you'll be in for one hell of a ride. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. For anyone who discovered me with this video, hey, I'm Ragnar, and on this channel I cover old games, horror games, indie games, or combinations thereof, and try bringing attention to video games that have fallen into obscurity, as well as outstanding indie titles that I want people to not miss out on. In my credit sequences I love to showcase indie games that I think are totally worth checking out, and since we've been talking about a classic survival horror title, today I'm showing you footage of my first hours of playing Tormented Souls, a recently released classic fixed camera perspective survival horror game, which is an unapologetic love letter to the origins of the genre. It really doesn't hide its inspirations such as Alone in the Dark, Rhythm Evil, Silent Hill, etc., really going for the appeal of where it all began. 
but it's so much more than just a cheap knockoff with nice modern graphics. I've not been able to finish it yet, but during my first three or four hours I've been exclaiming was quite frequently. Lots of cool ideas and clever mechanical twists, great aesthetic, and with its beautiful modern visuals it's a wonderful proof for the fact that the true old school, back to the roots survival horror is far from being an outdated, antiquated genre. Really hope to see more indie takes on classic survival horror in the future. If that sounds intriguing to you, go check it out, Tormented Souls. It's on Steam, PS5 and Xbox X, and will come soon to Switch, PS4, Xbox One and GOG on October 27th. <gasps> now, lastly, but very importantly, the work on this channel and everybody who partakes in making these videos is primarily crowdfunded. If you'd like to help us shed light on more forgotten and overlooked gems in the future, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. It makes a tremendous difference and is the de facto financial backbone of this channel. So thank you for considering and thank you to everyone who supports me there already. And a special thanks this time goes out to Giselle Almonte, Jin Hansen, Space Admiral Vivi, Puka Princess, Matt Gretton, Dana Rosa, Chris Chan, Kenan Ward, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Chuck Taylor, Cordelia Crescendo, Morgan Kay, Agustin Ortega, Isabella Stoner, Chrissy, Vincent Cavanaugh, Boris Bugling, Tara Flops, Raul Blanco, Murak Casardis, Samantha, Max Macula, Lawrence E. Buben, David Zelenak, Nineball9606, Hippo Hobbly, Billy Lott, Swagham, Tabby, Terry Collins, Serena Abramson, Kelly Michelle Russell, Baruga Dono, Neil Snowden, Tillabin, Catherine Escobar, Casper Rahm, Ian Rhodes, Bradley Douglas, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Thomas Brunner, Kevin H. Yang, Kyle Lee, Refkins, Shannon Blue, Lillian B, Dylan Labonte, Ronan Crom, aka Daniel242172, Laird Wackala, Christine Monaster, The Spiral Architect, Nikot the Brave, Federico Rocha, and Carrie George. Until next time, ta-ta.